Yeah, 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 yeah. That's going to happen. <laughs> so, what, what's the um, one wants a street, and there'll be money, David. I, I said, mm, I'm now interested. Oh, he's yeah. How do they think they're going to be money when I do everything for I, free? I know. I know. <laughs> so, I'm like, Kelvin, I killed the knife. I don't know. Is that any better? That's all right. Yeah. Let's have a look. He asked me to. <laughs> Is it better? I think it's better. Yeah, I mean... Still a bit... No, but it is better. Have a look at that. Because he's just got fine hair, so it's going to be... Good. That's better. It's tucked in more. Yeah, no. It was just better. a bit spray. It was just, it's just a bit distracting. Cause frizzies. I, the television doesn't like frizzies. Wow. I, I could get another very, two. Um, <laughs> it's very... It's very... Like, very... Clear. Clear. Yeah. Every... Every detail. Yep. That's why I don't get All right, shall we get underway? Uh, uh, well, are you ready? Gentlemen and lady. We are running. Okay, you're right? Yep. Okay. Tell me about the first moment when you said to yourself, I am Jesus. The first moment I said to myself, I am Jesus. Well, it wasn't really like that. Um, it was more to do... It was more of a gradual process over a period of about one week, I suppose, where I started having a whole series of pretty strong memories of my first century life, as well as my memories about spirit, my spirit life. And as a result of those uh, memories, um, I was sort of almost forced into accepting my identity, even though I didn't want to. So it, was, uh, it wasn't something that I wanted to to engage. It was a process that was happening emotionally because of my, my discovery of the Paget messages, which, are, which were the truths that we channeled to Paget a hundred years ago. And then as a result of those truths, we, we finished up, um, I, I finished up starting to read them. And then as I read them, I realised that I was, I actually knew what everyone was going to say before I read them. So that was very difficult for me to understand because I'd never had any kind of spiritual experience before then as so I you know I've felt always a deep connection with God and a deep love for God and a deep love for hu humankind but I've never really had a spiritual experience where I you know, that was suspicious of any of, of, of any change inside of myself going on and and so so when the uh, when I started reading them and then I started realizing that I was actually I knew what they were going to say before I read them Every single message, like there's, and there's quite, there's nearly two thousand messages in those in that book. So, don't um, you? Re but there must have been a moment when the, the thought happened. That's me. Um, I'm Jesus. No, I I, I spent the whole uh, a couple of weeks just crying about reading these messages, but knowing what I, what each one was going to say. But then, as I was doing that, as I was releasing things emotionally, then all of a sudden. Um, these thoughts came to me, but th that one, that one there is you, you know, like that kind of uh, that the person who was talking with Jesus, reading the message, that that's you, and 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 that was pretty difficult for me to come to terms with on a lot of levels. I, I'm a pretty logical person, as as most people who know me know, and so it's not something that I felt thought was possible. Although I've had many memories of the past that uh, about torture and abuse that I've always had my suspicions about and could not resolve, but uh, but I never really put it together uh, that, that 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 was because of m my memories about being Jesus. So right from a very young age, I've had other memories, but I've never said to myself, "Oh, that's because you're Jesus" or anything like that. It was only through reading the messages and then and then putting together the, the memories that I was having while I was reading the messages, along with all the other memories that I had through my life, that that it started to feel like, no, that that is me, and it was a very emotional experience. Um, that I spent months and months uh, of time crying about and, and not wanting to resolve. Like, I had a lot of fear about it. Um, I didn't want to say, say to anybody that I was Jesus or anything like that. And I, I just wanted to avoid the whole thing, really, to be frank. But, um, but the truths were there, and more and more of these truths, as I, as I uh, read them, I realised that there were more truths, aside from what I was reading, that I started writing down. And, and they were just flow, flowing to me, if you like, as well. And so after a while, the body of evidence mounted up that 
um, that no, this is, you know, you're having all these memories because this is you, you know. It's just like, I suppose, if you have memories of your own childhood, that's a recollection of your life and therefore it points to who you are. See, I, I can imagine also, I mean, let's go back to your, your upbringing. You were brought up as a JW. Uh, well, let's call him Jehovah's Witness for the sake of it. So, so uh, um, and, and that must have been pulling you in another direction as well. Your, can you talk about your life as a, as a JW? Well, um, for the first seven years of my life, we were, we were actually um, our Church of England. My parents were Church of England. And my mother um, always had a seeking heart with regard to truth. And she would often study the Bible with other religions. So she often had Mormons come around and she'd talk to them. And Jehovah's Witnesses come around and she'd talk to them. And Seven Day Adventists come around and she'd talk to them. And so... That's by pretty the... dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it dangerous that this well, of truth? Yeah. <laughs> like I don't see it as dangerous. I just see it as a, a person who's a seeking heart trying to discover truth. And um, and then she felt that the Jehovah's Witness faith was the closest to what she'd read in the Bible. And so and it, they they answered many of her biblical questions in a manner that satisfied her. And as a result, she started to embrace the Jehovah's Witness faith. And my father embraced it a couple of years later. And uh, as a result, we went along to the meetings and everything else. And, and then I began to actually look at the Bible quite deeply from probably the age of nine or so. And I, I was very fascinated about, about the, the Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, the Old Testament. And I read a lot of the prophets as a result. And uh, I was always very deeply fascinated about them through my entire life at, in the Jehovah's Witness faith. And I also, it, connect, it, it reconnected me, I suppose, to a large degree with my desire for God. So, so for me, while the Jehovah's Witness faith has many, uh, what I perceive as errors in it, it, it uh, for me, it, it helped me be connected to some of my pure desires. And those desires were to get to know God and also to demonstrate love to people. And uh, the faith gave me... Uh, quite a few opportunities to stay in my passions in those two areas. But, but um, I left the faith when I was 33 years of age um, and, and, it was on, and it was when I was 40 that I discovered the Paget messages. Um, and yes, my beliefs now are very, very different to the beliefs that, uh, that I had um, when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses would view me as the worst possible heretic they could consider. Uh, as a result of uh, as a result of me saying that I am Jesus, so. Well, I, I, look, I guess we've got to go through the story of you leaving the JWs. Um, now, there's the, uh, I mean, there's a story out there that you you were tossed out mm -hmm. because you spent um, some time in a motel with a prostitute. <laughs> well, what really happened was that. Uh, um, a pr few years prior, I used to be an elder in the Jehovah's Witness faith and um, as a result I used to look after a congregation that was considered to be the, the, pr the presiding overseer of a congregation was the person who organised the congregation basically. And, um, and then I had what would best be described as sort of like a nervous breakdown. I just was, I overworked myself tremendously. Um, and I went through this period where I just couldn't cope with very much work at all. And so I, I, I stepped down as, uh, as an elder in the faith. And then um, because I, as I stepped down in the elder, as an elder in the faith, there were also some other things happening where um, I started to feel feelings for, for another woman in the, in the church um, who wasn't my wife. And that troubled me greatly because um, although I knew at the time that my wife didn't actually love myself, I, um, and I'd known that for the prior seven years, I always felt that I could stay with her as long as I loved her. And, and then now I was confronted with the fact that I didn't love her anymore. And that was quite difficult um, to confront because of all of my religious upbringing about marriages for life and, and all of those kind of things. And so as a result of that, um, I finished up uh, going through a very sort of nervous, uh, sort of like a nervous breakdown. I was very emotional. And during that time, I got told many things from the elders in the congregation. And one of the things that I was, I was better off to, to commit suicide than I was to actually leave my wife and things like that. So, 
uh, there was a lot of unloving things said and done uh, um, through that time to towards a person. Basically, all I was doing was going through a, quite a difficult process emotionally. And, but that wasn't the bothering thing for me. The main bother for me was the fact that I didn't love my wife anymore. And I realised that I really had to leave her if I didn't love her. And I was thinking a lot about Paul's words in Corinthians, you know, and, and those kind of things about, you know, the, the, ma the man who ha is married to his wife must love his wife as his own flesh, you know. And, and those kind of statements preyed on my mind a lot and, and I realised that I couldn't do that. And then I, th so I, felt, I felt that I had to excommunicate myself from the church as a result. I couldn't follow that particular principle. And so as a result of that, um, um, I, some elders met with me and, and they told me that if I, if I left the church, I would leave my wife open to committing adultery, which is one of their beliefs. And so I said, so I said to them, well, you know, I, I, like the truth is I'm not going to get back with her because I don't love her and I can't stay with a woman who I don't love. And that to me was in disharmony with the Bible as well, to stay with a woman who you don't love. So. So it sort of left me in this, what I would call sort of like a scriptural quandary uh, that I was quite emotional about. And, and I decided that the best thing to do would be to, to go to, to Adelaide, the city that I, that where I, near I lived, go to a motel, invite a prostitute to come around, not do anything with her, but then just say to the elders that I'd, that I'd seen a prostitute, which is the words I said, and then let them make their assumptions from that. And so what happened was that uh, that's what I did. I, I went there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it now, um, but back then I was thinking about, probably thinking about my ex-wife, Cherie, and thinking about I didn't want her to feel like she was tied to me for the rest of her life because she was still in the faith. And I wanted her to feel like she had the freedom to remarry if she wanted to, and she subsequently did a few years later. And that's the reason why I did it. I wouldn't do it now, but... Uh, but I didn't actually sleep with the prostitute or anything. In fact, we had a talk about why she was in prostitution and we talked about her partner who was pimping her at the time and a lot of other things like that uh, for, the, for the time that we, we spent together. Yeah. So you, you got to have these memories. You began to sort of uh, have this sort of sense that you'd had this other life. Oh well, a life that had other dimensions to it. You've got a fairly clear recovery of your time in the spirit world, haven't you? Yeah, yes. I have. It's getting clearer as I yes. progress. So, you a statement to start that off? so I have a fairly clear recovery of memories of what my life was in the spirit world, and it's getting clearer in the, as the as I progress emotionally progress. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I'm finding is that uh, there are things that maybe I didn't remember some years ago, but now I'm remembering quite a lot of my life. I remember most of my life in the first century now, right down to quite uh, minute details, but also uh, remember quite a lot of my spirit life in the same regard, same way, right yeah. down to quite minute details. I, I look, I'll, I, I'd love to talk to you about the first century, but I, want, I mean, what, what's fascinated me, of course, is that, that We've talked about some of the people that you know in the spirit world. Yeah. Uh, people I'd love to meet. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, uh, like, um, tell me about your conversations with Plato. Uh, just in brief. And Plato, Aristotle, both Augustine, of them. Moses, <laughs> Gandhi. You know, I mean, this is this is fascinating. Okay. Um, well, who do you want to know about first? Well, t tell me about Plato. Well, Plato and Aristotle I met together, actually, um, because they, they firstly talked to John, the Apostle John. He was in the spirit world, and that John was quite often attracted to them because uh, Plato and Aristotle both have, in the spirit world, when they, after they pass, they both had a very investigative uh, attitude to the universe. And because of that, they were quite open, and so John used to go to visit them and uh, try to encourage them to, to discover the, the path to divine love, you know, the path of being born again. And, uh, and as a result, um, sometimes I got to spend some time with them as a result because John, of course, is one of my best friends and so we finished up going together sometimes and talking to the both of them. Um, the, the general thing that happened was that uh, Aristotle and Plato 
what they found was that they couldn't enter the seventh dimension of the spirit world. They were stuck in the sixth dimension for a, quite a long time. And, and they were quite confused as to why they were stuck because their theories that they had developed meant that they should be able to progress infinitely because they'd worked out that there must be an infinite God. So they should be able to progress infinitely and they couldn't work out why they couldn't progress into the seventh dimension of the spirit world. And, and even though they were trying. And, and John initially went to them without myself and talked to them about why they couldn't. But they didn't really believe what John was saying. They thought it was some kind of... Uh, so you're putting, you're, you're really in a way putting Plato and Aristotle right. You're... Um, yeah, that's not the way we see it when we're in the spirit world. We sort yeah. of see it as we love them and we'd like them to f experience the most bliss that they could possibly experience and also the most growth. And if there's a person with a seeking heart who desires more truth in their life, we're very happy to go to them. It doesn't matter uh, who they are and what, you know, who they are from the earth life. Uh, you know, they can be somebody who's considered on earth and no one, or they can be somebody like Aristotle and Plato who, who are well known philosophically on the earth. So it just, it just doesn't matter who, we, we, we will go to them based on their desire. So, and we don't have a feeling of we're better than them because we're not, we only discovered the divine love path through a process and therefore we just want to introduce the same process to other people who, who, who could experience more bliss in their personal lives too. Have you, you've had similar conversations with uh, Mahatma Gandhi, I, mm -hmm. I understand, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he said something interesting about he's had a change of views. Did, so just mention his name, Mahatma Gandhi. No, not yeah, Mahatma uh, Gandhi. Um, the, yeah, you, you were over the top of me, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go on. Mahatma Gandhi was a, was a lovely person on earth who often sought the truth, and he was very, very concerned and focused on the truth when he was on earth. And as a result of that, when he passed over in the spirit world, he, he, he also had the same attitude. He had some emotional injuries, though, with regard to, particularly with regard to how he viewed holiness and how he viewed sexuality. He sort of, on the earth, to a degree, felt that sexuality was a bit of a um, something that made you less holy in God's eyes, and that was something that he had to correct. But well, well, as I understand the recent biographical details, it turns out he had a very active sexual life. Of course, I think he was. I think he was doing the secretary, wasn't he? <laughs> he had he had a lot of guilt associated with um, his sex life on Earth as a result of his of his viewpoints. And as you see, quite often we have these re religious viewpoints which dictate one part of our life, but quite often our emotions are leading us in a completely different direction. And that applies to many people who are so-called holy men on earth. They're often doing things that uh, some people don't know about often uh, because they, they have these very firm religious viewpoints about holiness and those religious viewpoints don't match the viewpoints uh, that they have emotionally. And that's the case for me. See, I guess these are characters that we all admire. You know, these are, these are in a sense, big good men. Yep. Do you get to meet the likes of Stalin? And Lenin and Hitler. I mean, it, it's difficult to meet them in the spirit world because initially they pass over into very. very who, who just mentioned? Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult to meet uh, spirits like Stalin, Hitler, and all of those that have been involved in genocide, um, because they've killed so many people. Their heart is quite hardened, and as a result, they arrive in the deepest of the hells in the spirit world, which is very, very dark. And we get to visit them. Um, but it's very, very difficult to have an interaction with them because they don't acknowledge your presence and they don't want to discuss with you anything about their life. And so you can observe them, but you can't really speak to them very much. So while I've observed those characters in the, the lower realms of the spirit world on many occasions, uh, we of, and we often have groups of spirits surrounding them trying to assist them to get out of their condition, um, it, it's very, very hard to have personal interactions with them until they have an awakening of their soul. Are they, are they, what, what's, what are they in turmoil? Are they in torment? Uh... Most of the ones who have done lots of damage on the earth are not yet in turmoil or torment. They are in these very, very dark, hard conditions, but they're still full of rage and anger and, and racism and all sorts of other types of emotions. And as a result of that, it's very, very hard to connect to them. 
when they go through a transition into softer emotions of like realizing that they've killed millions of people, having some realizations about like you know with their life and how you know harsh it was and so forth towards others, and when they start having those breakthroughs, that's the time that you can actually start connecting to them. And I've I've had those personal interactions with ones like Caesar from the from uh, earlier times, uh, particularly the first Caesar of Rome, and and those kind of interactions happen. Uh, over periods of time, you know, because, because eventually their heart opens more and opens more and they want to know more and eventually you get to speak with them quite fr freely. And even ones that were responsible for my death, like Herod, um, I've actually talked to in the spirit world and he now is a celestial spirit, believe it or not. So he, he is... Um, I don't know. I'll take that bird. <laughs> that bird. Is, can I pull up? Stop the image. Sorry. Well, it was, it was fine, but... Oh, was I'm sorry. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, you're in full flight, but I, I mean, you'll, you can pick it up. You yeah. Know, you know. Well, look, can we talk about um, John? I, I mean, if, um, you mean the Apostle John? The Apostle John, yeah. in, in, in two ways. One, yeah. he's one of the 14. He's one of the 14 who returned, yes. Yes, but also, I mean, he was Hang murdered. Hang on, guys. Right. I don't want, maybe they're not too happy about this, are they? Is that what's going on? No, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's actually interesting, that bird. Um, um, just tell us, what do, you, well, what do you see in relation to that bird? Yeah, there's a group of spirits who are with us on the property right at the moment who don't want uh, a responsible interview to take place. And as a result of that, they're trying to influence different bits of nature to interfere with the interview quite a lot and you had that happening with Mary talking and you've got that going on when, when I start talking you notice they didn't do that when we were stopped when we stopped talking and that was quite interesting everything goes quiet then and, but as soon as we start talking everything livens up again so they, they, they go into birds you reckon no the spirits don't go into birds but they they through the emotional condition of ourselves so so for example Mary and myself are still open to emotions of attack and as a result of that, spirits can motivate animals and insects and, and birds to, to attack if, if, if that emotion is open in the individual. And because it's open in myself and Mary, we're open to that kind of attack still. Tell us about the 14. Yep. Who are they and what's their role in the scheme of things? Who are the 14? Um, the 14 are a group of people, seven souls, who reincarnated, you could say, but I don't like to use the term reincarnated necessarily because it's not the same as a, a Buddhist or, or Hindu type of uh, explanation of reincarnation. But they, they have come back to the earth, connected to a physical and spirit body, to express uh, some divine truth through to the earth again. But they have to go through a process of reconnecting with themselves because there's so much separation between our physical form and our spirit body form and the soul itself and we have to rejoin and so the, this, the 14 have to go through a process of remembering who they are first and that process is quite emotional and can be quite distressing and many of the 14 are in heavy resistance of that process so as a result uh, a lot of the 14 have come against uh, the divine truth gone into some emotional processes it's all gotten too intense for them to accept who they are and they've then gone off and living some of their other life until such a time as they have to revisit those particular emotions. Now as a result of that some of them may pass, um, some of them may pass in the future and John the Apostle John has certainly passed as a result of some of the denials that he went through. He, he passed about a month after he went into denial of his identity. And uh, as how, a, how did that happen? It happened because he had a whole lot of addictive emotions in play that he was unwilling to address and as a result of that he attracted, um, he attracted a man into his life. John's a homosexual and always has been right from the first century. He was homosexual in the first century as well. He attracted a man into his life to help him with his botanical gardens and when that uh, man, um, we've got stuff happening behind us now haven't we? Sure. Mm. Sure. And when that man um, came to him, he, John saw him as a person who could help him with his garden and so he had him stay and then John sort of slipped into this 
relationship with him, the sexual relationship with him. But then that was on and off. And as a result of that, the man got quite frustrated with John. And eventually, uh, John counseled the relationship, if you like, and sent the man on his way. But then um, w him and I went through this process of where John felt that he couldn't face his own emotions anymore. He couldn't face who he was anymore. And as soon as we left his, his property, he, the, the man came back and, uh, and about two weeks later, after the man returned, he murdered John um, out of rage um, towards him. Yeah. So, and that happened four, four or so years ago now. Tell us about Cornelius. He's one of the 14. Yep. Uh, Cornelius is one of the 14. He, he, um, he was the man who nailed the nail into my wrist in the first century when I was on the, when I was being crucified. He didn't nail the nail into my feet because he, during the time when he nailed the nail into my wrist, he, uh, I, I just looked at him and, and felt a lot of love for him and he, he'd actually come against me on a number of occasions prior to that and he, he just felt he couldn't do it anymore because of, uh, of my love for him at the time and he threw down the hammer that he was using and he walked away. Uh, as a result of that, he, he, he automatically incurred the wrath of the Roman army. He was the centurion in, in, in Jerusalem. And as a result of that, two weeks later, he was tortured to death. So. How do you feel today being around Cornelius? This is the guy that was, was uh, going to uh, crucify you. Well, I, I love him. I loved him then when he was crucifying me. Um, yeah. But and just a comment on t today when I see him, like when I was with him yesterday. Yeah, today when I see Cornelius, I just have a deep feelings of love for him. He, he's and as I had in the first century when he was crucifying me, um, and I, I love him dearly, and and I just feel I can feel a lot of his emotions as well, of course, because we've had a long association of nearly two thousand years. And uh, or over two thousand years now, and uh, and I still feel the same kind of love for him as I felt then. Yeah. Do you have? I don't know Mary was there. That's a, you know, that's a at very the crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, she she still really struggles with that. Um, yeah, she still. Well, going what do you? you I mean, when if if you go back, you know, what's going on inside you when you think about that? Um, I w with regard to the crucifixion, I went through lots of emotions over a period of nearly two years about that I began doing nearly six years ago and I finished doing around four or so years ago. And it was a very hard time recollecting all of that because you go through the experience, the memories of the experience and, and, it, and it's filtered through the, filter, the filters that I have emotionally now. So there was lots of, in fact, I had more grief now about the crucifixion than I had at the time uh, and so I had a lot of feelings to deal with as a result. I had a lot of feelings too about Mary because I, well, at the time I was in a, a, an atonement condition with God so I didn't feel the pain really of the crucifixion very much at all and I didn't feel the emotional pain of leaving her because I didn't feel like I was leaving her but Mary was not in that condition um, and so she felt the emotional pain of me leaving her and, the emo and a lot of the pain uh, soulmates feel the pain of each other quite strongly and so a lot of the pain I was going through she was more sensitive to than I was and so the crucifixion was a much harder event on her than it was on me at the time. And when I feel about it now um, I still have some sad emotions to feel some grief to feel about primarily about uh, more, more about the love I felt for everyone who was involved including the people who murdered me. Mm. I have other feelings too though about how Christianity has taken that act and turned it into their, sa their saving and I feel quite strongly that that's one of the primary errors of Christianity, believing that my blood saves them from their sin when in reality when they part, and this is one of the problems that face many Christians when they pass, is that they pass believing they've been saved from their sin but the truth is, sin can only, the only thing that saves you from your sin is God's love entering you and going through a process of repentance. 
And that is an individual process. It's not reliant on my blood or my sacrifice. And so many Christians pass expecting to be in a good condition but arriving in a worse condition than they expected. And many of them become very disillusioned with everything they've learnt on earth as a result. And that's sad because most of the, a lot of the things the Christians have learnt are true. But uh, unfortunately, they have a tendency then in the spirit world to throw out a lot of that truth because of some of the falsehood that they've also imbibed. Could, could we just quickly go through, say, three or four things that, that Christianity has got wrong? Um, you're not God. That's so can, can we so, just go through a couple of like, like that? So. Yeah, some, some very basic things I feel that Christianity has gotten wrong and mostly because of what happened after my death and the series of events that occurred after my death, these doctrinal uh, errors entered Christianity as a result of different people not being able to conceive the truth of what I was teaching at the time and so they wanted to change it to something they could conceive. And one of the primary doctrinal errors I feel they have is that God is a triune God. The truth is that God is not a triune God. God is an entity, a single entity, with whom you can connect like a parent. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I feel that is a primary thing that they've got uh, wrong is that God and Jesus are one, or in the sense of I am God, Jesus is God. And um, I certainly know I'm not God. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, every spirit in the spirit world knows that Jesus is not God. And this is one of the main errors that is still I I on the earth with regard to whether Jesus is God or not. There's this belief that Jesus is God because of my one condition while I was on earth in the first century. Now, it it's sort of like somebody, it's like seeing someone in a state of perfection and then thinking that they must be God because they're the only person around who's perfect. And what I was trying to teach was that everybody could become perfect. And I said, you must become perfect just like your Heavenly Father is perfect. But, but many Christians uh, think that, that, that I was saying it from the, from the position of being God. I often said to them, you are my brother and sister, which automatically means that I'm not God. I, I am a child of God just as they are. So that's another main doctrinal point I feel that's uh, quite an error. The third one is this viewpoint that as long as you believe you'll be saved, and it's not about belief, it's about your emotional and soul-based condition in love as to how well you go when you pass over into the spirit world. But what about John, mm -hmm. chapter 2? Mm -hmm. To as many as believed on him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. Yes, exactly. Like, believed? Every, yeah, no, the Greek word is pistio, you know, it's a very strong word. Everybody who believes what I say to them about the divine truth will become at one with God, will become sons of God. Everybody who believes what I say to them will become sons of God. It's, it, but it's, they have to believe what I say to them about the process of becoming at one with God to become at one with God. It's not an automatic process. And, it's not, and it does not mean that I didn't have to go through the same process. See, a lot of Christians don't understand why it took 30 years before I became known on earth in the first century. And the reason why is because I had to go through a process to become at one with God before I could demonstrate what at one with God meant. And did, you, did you do mi miracles? Yes, after I became at one with God. Yes, not prior. So, so sorry, uh, after I became one with God, I... After I became at one with God, I performed miracles. Not all the miracles that are listed in the Bible are the miracles I performed because many of those miracles were again modified to suit other religious formats and, and help them believe that mm. I was God, which I was not, which is unfortunate because it actually creates even more error and more error in belief. The, the truth is that I did perform many miracles. I healed sight of people who were blind. You know, I healed lame limbs of people instantly and all of those kind of things. And the so-called resurrections from the dead, well, the people w were in a state, um, what you would call more like suspended animation than dead. They still had their silver cord connected to their, to their, to their physical body from their spirit body. And when a person has their silver cord connected from the spirit body to the physical body, you can bring them back to life. And so that was certainly done in the case of Lazarus and others. And so, yes, a lot of the miracles that are listed, I, I did actually perform. There were some listed that I didn't, and they were introduced into the Bible to compare me with holy men from other religious uh, formats and uh, to make me just as good as they were, basically. Well, if you did miracles then, what miracles are you doing now? 
Um, I won't be doing... Uh, if you look back then, uh, the, with regard to the question of miracles, if you look back then in the first century, I only began performing miracles after I became at one with God. And that's because the, that once you become at one with God, the love in your soul is the same love that God has. And God can actually m move you and motivate you through that process to actually do what God desires to do. This is why it's not happening much on the earth today. Uh, there are miracles occurring, but not as much today because, because there are less people in a condition where, and there's no one in a condition of at one moment with God where they can heal instantly without, you know, and particularly heal limbs that are missing and all of those kind of things. And of course, those things will occur in the future again once people on earth become at one with God. Now, and, AJ, look, I've got to ask you this. Can if I answer you're... the question fully, though? Yeah, right, right, right. Is that right? And the, the issue with one, uh, one with God is what drove all of the miracles. It was God's will being acted through me. So I won't be able to heal a single person on this planet until God decides to do that through me and until I get into the condition where God can do that. And I can only get into the condition where God will do that when I become at one with God again. So I'll have to go through the same process I went through in the first century before that can occur. Now look, AJ, you are asking a lot of people. You're asking everything. You're asking people to, to give up their families, give up their homes, give up everything, and to come and follow you. That's what's happening. And I've yeah, I, don't, I don't agree with that, David. But it's happening. Yeah, the, but I, the people I don't are agree. throwing in their lot with you utterly. They just... They, they, they're coming and they're, they're, they're really just no, but, giving... They... But you preceded the question by saying that I'm asking that of them. I'm all right, not, all right, okay. Well, asking, that's what's happening, right? I am not asking anything of anybody. Their desire and their passion is what needs to motivate them in their life. All I'm doing is telling them the truth about how things happen. And I'm telling them the truth about God. And I'm telling them the truth about their soul. And the truth about many of the untruths that are on earth today. All I'm doing is telling them the truth and I, give, I, I perfectly honour their free will to make the choice to do whatever they will with that. Now, some of them have decided to leave families. Now, I don't necessarily agree with deciding to leave families. I certainly haven't left mine. I still have an interaction with mine. However, there are times when the families become so upset about what you're, you know, what you're believing that sometimes out of love of yourself, you do need to stay away from them for a while. But I, I'm not encouraging leaving anything. I'm encouraging getting together with everything in love. But sometimes that's not possible to have a love of yourself and a love of, and, and, and receive a barrage of hatred from somebody and still stay in the position. And so in those cases, the people uh, may finish up leaving their families for a period of time. I'm not encouraging that because my feelings are love binds everything together. It doesn't separate everything, but it has to be real love. And the problem on the earth at the moment is we have so much false love, we have so much addiction in play, that, that most of our relationships of addictive, uh, are addictive and, and related to addictions. And so when somebody does what we don't want them to do, we get upset. Now, I don't, it doesn't worry me if you do what I don't want you to do. It doesn't concern me, like, because I don't feel, uh, all I want to do is love you. I don't want you to do anything because of that. And I don't want any person to follow me unless they want to follow the truths that I'm teaching. And in that regard, they're not following me, they're following the truths that I'm teaching. It's the, in the end, it's the truth that will set you free from all of these addictions and all of these other things that are going on in your life. And that's what I'm encouraging. Now, others who are listening to the message sometimes misinterpret all of that, but that's their, again, their free will in play. They're allowed to misinterpret what they wish. And I'm constantly trying to correct most of that in the seminars that I give and so forth about love. But, but whether a person listens to the truth about love or not is totally, in, that, that's totally independent of me. I, I don't have control over that and I don't want to ever have control over that either. Well, look, if you're not at one with God, uh, then why should they trust you? Well, uh, to be frank, I'm, I'm quite amazed that some of them do. <laughs> but. Um, the truth is that, that they, what happens a lot with people when they hear the divine truth is the divine truth resonates with things in their soul. They start wondering, they start pondering, and they start feeling like, wow, there's a lot of things here that sort of make sense to me, that have never made sense to me before. And once they connect with that emotionally and they start feeling, wow, this, is, this feels like to be truthful, 
the truth is that many of them will follow that truth even though they may not believe that I'm Jesus or they may not believe that Mary's Mary Magdalene or any of those things. And as you know, many of the people who come along to the seminars are unsure on those issues. However, they are attracted to the truths that they feel, uh, that they personally feel are being heard by them. And to me, that's the reason, that's the thing that's motivating many of them at the moment to, to follow what I'm saying to them to do. Um, in the future, obviously as I, as I and then Mary, Mary and then others become at one with God, there will be living proof on the earth that what I'm saying to them right now is true. But obviously this period of time, there's not that living proof. They can see the changes that Mary has made over a period of three years. They can see the changes that I've made over a period of six years. And that can illustrate the truth to a degree. But until we become at one with God, there won't be the firm evidence that everybody requires uh, to, to prove that I am Jesus or not. And um, once that at one moment occurs, then obviously there'll be much more strong evidence about whether I am Jesus and about whether Mary is Mary Magdalene and whether others of the 14 other people we're saying them to be. But, but at this stage, I don't really expect anyone to believe. I'm just following my passion of telling the truth and, and giving the truths out there to anybody who wants to listen. And if they want to listen and follow it now, that's their, that's their decision. And, I, and to me, I applaud that decision because I feel that if they do that, their lives will benefit immensely as a result. And there are many people who have had large benefits in their life as a result. This is a question people want answered, I guess. Tell me about the money. How are you paying for this? How you're not. You're not working. Mary's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of DVDs going out. There's a lot of stuff happening. How are you paying for this? How we pay for everything is through donations that we receive. So we don't actually have collections at any of the seminars or anything like that. We just have a mechanism on the internet that people can donate to us, and we have a mechanism on the at every seminar. We have just a contribution box at the back of the hall where people can donate to us. And what we do with that money is we get that money. Myself and Mary obviously live on some of that money. You can see from the environment you have here that we live quite frugally. We don't live um, you know, with, with a lot of funds. We don't need a lot of funds to live. And I already owned this property before I began doing all of this, so it's not like the property has been purchased through the funds of others. But what we do with the but money... But you've been given the property. Um, no, not at this point. We well, it, but it's happening, right? The, the God's Way of Love organisation, which is a non-profit yes. organisation that we're setting up, uh, there's five people who own that, or, who own that property, a, a 600-acre property nearby, yep. and they want to give that property to the God's Way of Love organisation. So that's, for, but that's the same as giving it to you, really. I mean, you... No, it's not. <laughs> of course it is. You make all the decisions. You're like a benevolent monarch. Uh, <laughs> um, no, the way I see it is that that's a gift they are giving to to the world to demonstrate the truths that are being presented. Um, that so that property to so this property that you have here where we're doing this interview, this is my and Mary's property, which I bought way before I began uh, having donations at any hall, and and the property down there is yet to be given to the yeah. God's Way of Love well, organisation. Can but can I answer the question, the other question about the money in full? What happens is we receive the funds and then after myself and Mary take out enough for living on, we actually spend the rest of the funds uh, after taxation is paid. We spend the rest of the funds on getting together things that we feel will spread the word. And so uh, the, the DVDs are all produced uh, voluntarily and we, we produce them for about a dollar fifty each or something. And what we do then is we just give them away at the seminars, as you've seen. And uh, the same goes with all the material that is downloadable from the websites. All of that's given away for free. None of it's copyrighted. We want the truth, the divine truth, to get out there without any restrictions. And so all of the money we receive goes into the sound systems and the DVDs and all of those kind of things. Most of the, almost all the effort is voluntary as well. So, and so what happens is that all of that money gets fed back into having the truth get out there even further. Well, give us an idea of your budget. What, what's, what, uh, how much did you spend last year? What are you going to be spending well, this year? Well, can I give you an idea of last weekend? Because um, I've just counted up the funds from last weekend. Last weekend, uh, we received $9,000 from donations. 
I spent uh, last week, in, in preparation for last weekend, we spent $6,000 on giving away DVDs. We spent another nearly $1,000 on hall hire and hall hire costs. And we spent, um, I spent $3,500 on sound equipment uh, that I ordered uh, and set up ready for the event. The event. So, so actually I spent more money than what um, we actually received last weekend. But often on a weekend we will receive that amount of funds and then we spend most of it on giving away DVDs and, and all those things. And we only, myself and Mary, only need around about $1,000 a month to live on. And so once we take that, those funds out, we spend the rest on doing as much as we possibly can to, to get everything done. So that's how we live, even though we don't have a job, basically. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Mm. Just cut there, because we've got to change this. Okay.